everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Motivational Monday webinar. Uh, it is my pleasure to be hosting this today with Dr. Robert Brooks. Um, my name is Karen Hupperts and I am a volunteer with the International Dyslexia Association. I am the uh, immediate past president with the Georgia branch and I am a regional rep with the organization. I'm also the very proud parent of two dyslexic adults. And uh, so I'm very uh, immersed in this topic and excited to hear more of what Dr. Brooks has to stay, say today. Uh, our topic today is Resilience in Challenging Times, part two. Hopefully you saw part one of this webinar, uh, Nurturing Hope and Resilience in Our Children is our topic today. Uh, this webinar will highlight the lifelong impact that even one adult can have on a child's sense of hope and resilience. And Dr. Robert Brooks will describe the importance of empathy in understanding and responding effectively to children and suggest exercises for strengthening empathy. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get to an uh, introduction of Dr. Brooks. We have our next two webinars are upcoming. They are both... Um, on supporting reading comprehension. The first is uh, we'll have free resources for remote, hybrid, and in-person teaching. And the second is titled Supporting Comprehension Through Writing About Reading Instructional Suggestions. Uh, both of those will be excellent, so please check our website and eblast for uh, the dates and information on those so you can sign up and uh, get your questions in early. Uh, and, and to that note, we are really thrilled to have you as subscribers to our YouTube channel. Uh, we've gained a lot of new subscribers in the last few weeks, probably thanks to Dr. Brooks' great uh, <laughs> webinar. And uh, we hope that you'll continue to uh, participate in those and sign in, uh, subscribe to our button on YouTube and like us on Facebook for these. Anytime you like it, that lets other teachers or parents who might be interested in topics see it as well. Uh, I've also wanted to mention that our IDA National Conference is uh, going to be virtual this year. It's going to be phenomenal and it's priced extremely attractively. So um, please consider registering for that. Uh, the dates are November 13th and 14th and there's special pricing for families. So please don't miss that. It's uh, all of that is on our website. And uh, we'd also really like to encourage you to consider contributing to the COVID relief fund. Um, this is very important. As many of you know, with school starting back, a lot of students do not have access to the resources they need. Um, it, as simple as having computers and laptops and tablets um, so when you give to this fund, we're giving the money back to schools, back to individuals um, in the terms in, in, with materials, with software, in some cases with tutoring services and advocate services. So please consider giving that. And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Robert Brooks is a clinical psychologist on the faculty of Harvard Medical School and former director of the Department of Psychology at McLean Hospital, a private psychiatric hospital. His first uh, position at McLean was as principal of the school in the locked door unit of the child and adolescent program. He has lectured nationally and internationally and written extensively about such themes as psychotherapy, motivation, resilience, parenting, and family relationships, and, as, uh, and a positive school and work environment. He is the author and co-author of 18 books. I don't know where he has the time, including Raising Resilient Children, The Power of Resilience, Achieving Balance, Confidence, and Personal Strength in Your Life, and Handbook of Resilience in Children. Dr. Brooks has received many awards for his work, including Hall of Fame awards from both the Connecticut Association of Children with Learning Disabilities and CHAD. Most recently, he was given the Mental Health Humanitarian Award from William James College for his contributions as a clinician, educator, and author. And I really would encourage you to visit his website. I spent quite a few hours perusing some of his articles uh, just yesterday. His website is www.drrobertbrooks.com. 
and I will turn things over to Dr. Brooks at this point. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for that lovely introduction. I'm just going to share the screen and get to my PowerPoint now. And just here and okay. So I want to thank Karen. I had a wonderful time presenting part one. So I'm now looking forward to presenting part two. Uh, just to mention what Karen had said that uh, on my website, I have many briefer articles on the topics I'm addressing today, if you're interested. And any of you on Twitter, uh, because of my older son, Rich, whose whole field is social media, I am on Twitter. And about uh, twice or three times a week, I do tweet out articles, uh, links to articles, actually, and many of them are related to education and mental health. So I just want to mention there are other resources available uh, in terms of my writings and articles I tweet out. Uh, the very first slide I'm going to that I really added lately is being kind to ourselves. This may seem so obvious. I could spend just an hour on this, but I've heard from so many parents and teachers, mental health professionals, how difficult these times are. And so I just want to say the following, that I think we have to have realistic expectations for ourselves. And what that means is we have to give ourselves and our we do have to be kind to ourselves. These are such unprecedented times. I'm going to suggest certain things that today that I don't want anyone to walk away and feel if it doesn't work or some of these ideas don't work, that there's something wrong with you. I think we have to just expect that at times things are not going to work and we have to find really time for self-compassion. And if you're able to see part one, I talked about how we could take care of ourselves, steps we could take. And I, I would strongly urge you to look at that part one again so that we can practice self-care and self-compassion. A, a, a brief review of some key points from part one. One is resilience. I just wanna give a very brief definition because there are different definitions of resilience. It's the capacity to cope effectively with adversity. A key word there is cope effectively or key words. Resilience doesn't mean you're not going to face problems. Resilience doesn't mean you're not going to feel stress at times. But resilient people see problems as things to be solved rather than overwhelmed by. So the mindset we want to see in ourselves and our kids is problems are going to come up. We've certainly seen many the last few months. But that more and more we feel comfortable that we could step back and think of ways of coping with these so we can really bounce back from adversity. Again, I went into greater detail in part one, but I just want to go over a few of these key concepts. Another key concept, which relates so much to today's talk, has to do with charismatic adult. And let me again review what that is. Uh, as I had mentioned last time, as I became more and more interested in resilience, I, I wondered what helps some people to be resilient while others are not. And in fact, a number of psychologists started to interview people who had really struggled with adversity as kids. Some grew up in war zones. Some grew up, unfortunately, in abusive homes. Many of you already know, and why I'm speaking and thrilled to speak for IDA, is I've always been interested in kids who have struggled in school, where they really felt like failures in school, and yet you meet them as adults, and they're much more hopeful and they're much more optimistic than you would have ever imagined. They have decent jobs, good relationships. And so when research was done asking these people who had had very difficult childhoods, what do you think was one of the most important things in your childhood, as difficult as it was, to help you to be more hopeful and optimistic and resilient today? In almost every study that was ever done, bar none, the first answer was always the same. It sounded so simple but maybe I'll, I've often said in a spiritual way, it's why we're all here. They could all talk about at least one adult who truly believed in them and stood by them. 
And in the 1980s, one of my heroes in the field of psychology, the late psychologist, Julius Siegel, he wrote an article where he referred to that supportive adult as a charismatic adult in a child's life. And although sometimes I almost wish he hadn't used the word charismatic because it could have different meanings, his definition is nothing short of poetic. He says a charismatic adult is an adult from whom children gather strength. And I love that image, gather strength. And for the teachers listening, in that same article, he said in a surprising number of cases, maybe we shouldn't be surprised, the charismatic adult in a child's life turns out to be a teacher. So we all need these charismatic adults. And I've often gotten the question, what does a charismatic adult think about? What's one of the main things? And last time, and it's going to be a key point in this webinar as well, charismatic adults, to be that way, adopt of basically what I call personal control. They focus their time and energy on things over which they have control rather than things about which we have little, if any, control. And one of the things I emphasize is this. So much has been going on, you'll see that in a couple of subsequent slides, that it's often difficult to think about personal control. But we often have mo much more control out over our attitude and response to events than we may realize. So while there are things like COVID-19 that we may have little control over, what we have found is we have more control over things in terms of our attitude and response than we may realize. And as you'll hear, one of the main things we can help children with in order to be resilient is to help them to look at those areas over which they can have some control. I don't mean being controlling, but over which they can respond to events in ways in which they feel a greater sense of coping. What I'm, this slide shows, and it may seem very obvious, it is especially important during these unprecedented, uncertain times, including to what extent learning will be in-person, remote, or hybrid. And to quick digression, I have collected a folder in the last two weeks related to what schools will look like. It could drive people crazy if they look at it. There are some that say, I just got one, that hybrid learning is one of the worst forms. Others say hybrid may be, be the only most effective form. So I realize that there's such confusion and anxiety about it. But regardless of what form it takes, we must strive to develop an attitude of personal control. And it's a very difficult task, but a very significant one if we are to serve as charismatic adults in the lives of our children and students. Thus, while there's so much uncertainty around, we have to start looking at what are the things, though, that we can impact on and influence. And that is some of the main points I'm going to make here. How can we help kids during these uncertain times when we don't even know what everything will look like. When we don't know what the future holds, how can we still look at, okay, how can we serve as a charismatic adult in the life of our children? And what this brings up is, what are the characteristics and mindset and accompanying strategies of charismatic adults who nurture resilience in themselves, their students and their colleagues? I've often gotten the question, okay, Bob, I would love to be a charismatic adult. What do I say or do? What are some of the things that I have to look at within myself so that I could help ch children, the students, and even my colleagues, family members to be more resilient? Again, it gets back to how do we work on things within ourselves? That's why when we talked about doing a two-parter in terms of these IDA webinars, I said, let's start with what we could do for ourselves and then when we feel more resilient, when we feel a greater sense of personal control, we can translate that, that into specific actions we can take to help our children. To help answer this question, I would like you to reflect on how you would answer the following questions. And this is just to set the tone, but all of these questions are certainly very important setting the tone for being a charismatic adult. 
ask yourself, who was a charismatic adult in your life as a child or student? And I realize there are different experiences you had, but who was that person? I hope you had many, but think about one or two even. An adult from whom you gathered strength. As I said, I hope there were many along the way, although some of the research I found is some people had difficulty even thinking of one. What did that person say or do that made him or her a charismatic adult for you? You know, if this was a seminar where I could see everyone, I'd love to hear from people, but you could just do it yourself or, you know, with family members. What did that person say or do that made him or her a charismatic adult for you? I mean, right away, I could think, in addition to my parents, I could certainly think of some teachers along the way who I couldn't wait to be in their class, in their presence. They were so supportive. And it got me to think a lot about what they did. And it's at all times. I remember one of my supervisors when I was already a postdoctoral fellow, I had my PhD. And I learned so much from him, the way he spoke with me as a postdoctoral fellow. And I remember saying, when if I have the opportunity, which I did, to train future mental health professionals, I want to think about what he did and said for me that helped me then to be much more effective with the trainees that who I was training. And then I always ask, do you use memories of your charismatic adults to guide what you do with your children or students today? Think about those wonderful moments and how you could create them with your kids. And while some people say to me, it's a different generation, there's so many things going on now with COVID-19 and the murder of George Floyd, there are certain memories I have that transcend time that really are applicable in any situation. And so let's look now at this, to appreciate the importance of empathy in understanding and responding to others. In all of my writings, in all of my books uh, about resilience, one of the things I most mention is this. It is almost impossible to be a charismatic adult in the absence of being empathic. You've all heard the word empathy. It basically means to put yourself inside the shoes of another person and to see the world through their eyes. It is both a, a, has cognitive and emotional factors because you, to put yourself in someone else's shoes, you really have to have a certain level of cognition and also you have to understand what feelings are about. I've read about four or five of Daniel Goleman's books, two of the ones that I refer to here. His first main one was called Emotional Intelligence and his second had to do with Social Intelligence. And what he said is more important than IQ is in emotional intelligence may be EQ. And he said, we have to help our children in addition to academics to develop emotional and social intelligence. And he said, one of the main parts, I don't have a time to go into all of what he included under emotional, but one of the main parts of emotional intelligence is empathy. And he said, this is what we really have to emphasize how we model it and how we, really development in our kids. So I don't know why we're getting this swooshing sound. So these are questions to nurture empathy. And when you have a chance, you could write them down now or just think about them, how you would answer. One of what those words are. When I do this in person, you know, often I'll hear things like, I hope that uh, your children say, you know, my, my students say that I care about them. I hope they mention caring in there. And I'll say, okay, but if they mention that word, ask this, what do I intentionally say or do on a regular basis so they are likely to describe me in the way I would like them to describe me? So let's say you say, I hope they feel I care about them. Well, what are you gonna intentionally say or do on a regular basis so they're likely to describe me in the way I would like them to describe me? What if you wrote down, I hope they realize even if it's remote learning that I'm accessible to them. Well, what are, what are, you, what are you gonna say and do? For the parents listening to this, the same thing. 
how do I hope my kids will describe me? But what do I say and do on a regular basis so they're likely to describe me in this way? And the word intentionally is intentionally put in italics because we really have to think about our actions and how our kids see us because we're really putting ourselves in the shoes of our children. I'm sorry for that whooshing sound. It wasn't there when I did this. I don't know if you can even hear it. How do I think they would actually describe me? So look at these three questions. How do I hope they would describe me? What do I, do I intentionally say and do on a regular basis that are likely to describe me this way? And how do I think they would actually describe me? Boy. If how I would like my children, students to describe me differs a great deal from how they would actually describe me, what steps must I take to bring the two descriptions closer together? You know, what are the steps that I have to take? And just to give you a personal example, I, I'm going to show you some pictures that a kid did of his teacher. This was a boy who had reading problems and attentional problems, and he was a great artist, and I saw him in therapy. And he told me that he had a teacher in the fourth grade who used to say to me all the time, you're lazy, you're unmotivated, you're never going to amount to anything in life, you better get your rear end in gear. And this kid actually became school avoidant because of this teacher. And one day when I was seeing him in therapy, it was right around the time I was writing a book about school climate. I, I actually shared with this boy, at that point, he was probably in about the seventh or eighth grade. I actually shared with this boy some of my thoughts about empathy. And I said, you're a great artist. He had actually won some contests, art contests. And I said, would you like to draw some pictures for my new book? And he looked stunned. I said, yeah, I have a chapter on empathy. He actually read it. All the chapters in that book were brief. And I said, I'd like you to draw a picture of how you think your teacher saw you every day in the fourth grade. Now, this boy, whose name is Rob, if, if he's a man today, I mean, he was a very cute kid, handsome man, but this is what he drew. He drew a picture and he's sick in the brain and a very perceptive kid and now very perceptive man. He said, you know, when someone like a teacher or even a parent sees you as sick in the brain and you feel that, you really start to wonder, maybe I am sick in the brain. I then asked this boy to draw a picture of his teacher. I don't know if any of you have seen drawings of you by your kids or your students. It's a Popeye looking structure. The kid on the right is saying, thank God it's him and not me being yelled at today. And on the, uh, the wall, there's the saying, work sets you free. I don't know if you know where that comes from, but that was an infamous slogan used by the Nazis on every concentration camp. At the entrance of every concentration camp, there was this work sets you free. And I, I, I will tell you, I was so stunned. I actually said to Rob, your teacher has a Nazi slogan in the room. You would love Rob. He said, just like, nah, but you told me I could do what I want. That's my editorial comment. And that's how it appears in the book. As a matter of fact, I was so taken by that, that years ago, my wife and I were in a uh, vacation in Eastern Europe and we visited a concentration camp and this, I was stunned. This is work sets you free in German. And all I could think about was my patient Rob and how he saw his classroom that way. And all I could think about were the thousands and thousands of people who those were the last words many of them read as they walked in there. One kid's remembrance of school or this picture. And it's so important to be empathic, to think about how our kids see us. And it's, it's not always easy. And sometimes we do not know. I've actually had uh, teachers have actually wanted regularly getting feedback from students about how they come across to them. So just, uh, we have to think about that. I'm actually gonna go back because I wanna tell you uh, a story, how even if quotes your so-called so expert, how sometimes when you get upset or annoyed, with your own children, or you may say and do things that are not very empathic. See, it's very easy to be empathic towards those kids who basically follow along with what we want. It's very easy to be empathic when every day your kids wake up and say, we are so fortunate to be members of this household. By the way, if they say that, be suspicious. But you know what I, I learned? How difficult it is to be empathic 
when we're upset, annoyed, disappointed, or angry with our kids. Empathy goes down the tubes. We say and do things that we would never once said or done to us. So my older son, Rich, who's very successful today, he did no work in school in the eighth, ninth, 10th, and 11th grades. This was very painful for me because I was lecturing all over the country on how to motivate students. Every one of Rich's teachers had taken my workshop on how to motivate students. I think I may be the only parent who ever received a warning slip where I was quoted on the warning slip. Can you believe the teacher was trying to be nice? He said, I think this is part of the adolescent rebellion you told us about. And I remember saying, I don't care about the adolescent rebellion. He's going to do his work. And for four years, except for summer breaks, and you'll see how this ties to empathy. Can any of you guess the very first thing I said to Rich, the moment I came home from work where I was this empathic doctor at a psychiatric hospital, the very first thing, Rich, did you finish your homework yet? Rich always said yes, but he hadn't. And after a while of hearing this, I started feeling estranged with my own son. Why would you ever ask your, your kid a question the moment you came home, did you do your homework? When you right away know it's gonna cause tension. It was my own anxiety. It was my own wanting Rich to do his homework. Part of it was my own ego. How could Robert Brooks's son, the expert on motivation, not be motivated? Rich was very motivated, just not in school. He was president of the youth group in our town. He, he, he volunteered at a homeless shelter to teach reading to, to some of the residents there. But you know what it's like? I never see an empathic father would have asked this question. I wonder how my son Richard experiences it when the moment I come home, the first thing I ask is, did you do your homework? I mean, for the parents there, how would we like it if we came home from work or even if we're working at home and you know, at the end of the day came out of our home office and our kid asked us this, did you finish all your work at work today? Because if you didn't, there shouldn't be any television for you tonight. And you know, if you worked a little harder, we could get along better. Well, that's how our kids often hear us. If you worked harder, you could do better. And there's no TV if you don't finish your work. What I learned is when we're upset, annoyed, or disappointed in another person, it's very difficult to try to put ourselves in their shoes. But that's when we most have to. I've, I once heard someone say, we have to love our children the most when sometimes we're upset with them the most. So with that in mind, let's think about being empathic. What do we have control over? Then let's get very nitty gritty for the rest of this webinar. See, I often ask this question, what theory of motivation guides your action with your children and students as you strive to nurture learning? Look at all these words, intrinsic motivation, caring, hope, and resilience. See, I started asking myself as part of my career, Bob, when you're doing therapy, what theories are you using? What, what leads people to want to work with you to change? I, I coined a term called motivating environments. How do you create environments where everyone wants to be, whether it's at home, at school, where people really are going to work more cooperatively with each other? So there are several theories which I really like, but the one I'm going to especially go over today is one you'll see on my website. I talk about a great deal. And if you're interested in one of my favorite books on motivation, but it's by Daniel Pink called Drive. He also selects this theory to discuss a great deal. The theory is based on the work of two psychologists at the University of Rochester, Edward D.C. and Richard Ryan. They called it self-determination theory, SDT. And when I read this theory many years ago, I realized that much of the work I was doing really resonated with their theory. And what I really liked about their theory was whether you're using it at home, at school, and I, I, I discussed the same theory in the business world with business leaders, wherever you're using it, it's very applicable. You can apply it right away. So I'm gonna share this theory as I do, and we'll have time for some Q and A. As I do, I want us to think about, okay, how can we use this at home? As a matter of fact, uh, I wanna mention, in, just in case some of you are familiar with Glasser, 
William Glasser, a psychiatrist, choice theory, and he wrote books like Reality Therapy in the Quality School, or the Circle of Courage model advocated by Brentro, Broken Leg, and Verbachern, you will certainly see overlap. If you're not familiar with these two other theories, you may want to get more familiar because they also resonate with the strength-based approach I like to use. And I just put this in, as we review DC and Ryan's model of motivation, of course, we have to consider how best to adapt it to the disruptive realities imposed by COVID-19. You know, usually this time of year, I start being the opening day speaker at a number of school districts. And so when I talk about DC and Ryan's model, I'm in front of hundreds of teachers and I'm saying what you could do at the beginning of the school year. But we have to consider how do we modify it? We have no control over what's been going on. What we have control over is how can we take some of these ideas about motivation, some of these ideas about resilience and apply it, even when we're not certain right now what the school is gonna look like and the relationships with teachers are gonna look like. So I'm gonna give some thoughts but in the Q&A, perhaps we'll have more time uh, for other thoughts for me to enumerate. So this is what the theory based is consciously met, systematically met. We can pr predict almost in advance what is going to happen. That we know that people are gonna be more motivated, say it's a school to learn. When these needs are not meant, we can almost predict that it's gonna be a much more difficult environment. So I'm gonna go over four needs that I always emphasize for schools. I say, this is what we have to help students feel. This is what we want to do so that when students enter the school environment, they're gonna feel more comfortable, but it's anywhere. I always put this need first, the need to belong and feel connected. And I added the word welcome. Positive relationships provide the foundation for learning and emotional and physical well-being. The problem is with remote learning, it's more difficult to feel you belong and are connected. But you know, I remember when I read the word welcome, a teacher had written, teachers should spend less time going over every rule and regulation of a school and more time asking this question. How do I make every child feel welcome in my presence? And I was so interested in that word. There was an educator Perky who used to talk about invitational schools. How do you invite people in? So this goes back a number of years as I was speaking in different schools. I was given permission to ask kids between the ages of four to 17, 18, what could a teacher or school administrator or any adult in the school say or do almost every morning to help you feel welcome here? Because I was very interested. What do people see as most important? Do you know two of the most common responses I got would just, in one sense, you could have almost expected. One was, greet me by name. And what they meant is, I want them to know who I am, that they could use my name. And the other was, and if I was, we were live right now, I'd say, what do you think? Was a smile. Sometimes people say a smile, and it's not a false smile, like I love everyone in this class, but a smile. Kids notice whether we as adults are genuinely smiling. We notice whether kids are smiling. When I consult about kids who are having difficulty in school, invariably, I don't have to bring it up. Teachers will say, that kid has quite a smile or their eyes are always glinting on this. As a matter of fact, I saw one middle school kid who had learning and attentional problems. And I said to him, whenever I worked with kids who are, especially if they're having trouble in school, I always went up to the school to meet their teachers because I felt the more I could meet the teachers, the more it could be part of the overall therapy, the more effective we could all be and have a coordinated program. So I said to the somewhat disorganized kid, I'm smiling to tell you this, I said, I'm going up to your school to meet your teachers. And I always love to do this. Would you describe your teachers to me? And he spoke very rapidly, more rapidly than I did. Okay, I have six teachers. Five of them I love and they love me. One teacher I hate and she hates me. 
And I was so taken aback. I said, what? And he said, okay. And I have a favor to ask you. I said, what? When you go up to the school, I see you like to kid around. Would you tell one of your funniest stories? And I said, okay, why? Because the five teachers will love me and I love them. They'll all smile. If teacher hates me, I hate her. She won't even smile. I said, she won't even smile. Why? Just only out of the mouth of a middle school disorganized boy. He said, just like this, she can't. I said, she can't. And then he, I, this was one of the greatest lines I've heard in therapy. I think she has paralysis of the mouth. I was stunned. I went up to the school. I said, I'm going to tell a really funny story. We all have quotes, war stories. I tell a story. Five of the six teachers start smiling and laughing. They tell me their stories. There was one teacher the whole time. I don't know if I captured. Just didn't say a word. Looked very angry. Never smiled. Thank heavens my self-control has improved over the years because a few times I felt like saying, excuse me, do you suffer from paralysis of the mouth? But I didn't say it. I didn't. The next session, when I was going to see the boy, I said, I wonder if he's even going to remember. I went up to the school. They don't forget. The very first thing when he comes in, he says, so? I said, you were right. She never smiled. <laughs> well, again, I only had the mouth of a middle school kid. He says, Dr. Brooks, can you help her? And all I can think of saying is, I'm not a plastic surgeon. I don't deal with paralysis of the mouth. But kids notice this. Now the question is, how do you help kids feel belonging and connected if you're doing remote learning? For years, you'll see articles on my website. I, I used to say even before remote learning that we should have an orientation period, that there should be no academic work or very little the first few days of school. What you should do is to start thinking about how you meet this need and the others I'm gonna bring up in a, in a few minutes. Develop the relationship because once a kid feels comfortable in your presence, they're gonna be much more likely to learn. The same is true as parents. Richard did not feel connected to me as a father. It's painful for me to say when I kept asking him, did you do your homework? As a matter of fact, just today, there was a story in USA Today, if you go online, where a lot of the story was continuing social emotional learning, even when you're doing remote learning. And they talk about different schools, one in which the first week of school, the teachers are told, get to know the kids, just talk about what it's going to feel like to do this remote learning. Don't worry about academics. And there are several school districts, that's what they're telling the teacher. Develop the relationship. So how do we respond to this need for belonging connectedness in a time of remote learning? That's why I was happy to see articles like this. The relationship is paramount. You know, my son, Rich, uh, the one who did no work, is a small business in school, a small business owner in Portland, Maine. And he, every morning, when they weren't getting together at all, would have a meeting with his staff, just 10, 15 minutes. And he said to me, it was so powerful to connect. I think this is what we have to do in schools. It may be easier, someone said in elementary schools, but there should be a number of kids with one teacher, at least even in high schools, just getting together a couple times a week, first thing in the morning, maybe every morning, just like a class time, a homeroom time, just to connect so that the kids start feeling a sense of connection. The second anything they do. So I ask this question, what input and choices do all members of a school community feel they have at school? And I say, what choices at home? In no way am I asking any adult listening to give up a, a, a sense of a th th their sense of authority. But I think there's many opportunities to ask if a book report, you know, what book they would like to read. I think at home, when, when kids even do a study, they still should have maybe, a, you know, a certain times of study, but can there be a certain order to things? I think what is very important here, especially if uh, there's a lot of remote learning, is to build in regular feedback from the students and parents. We're all partners in this. Regular feedback of how is this going? Whether it's remote or a hybrid, how is it going? Get feedback from the kids. What do they think will be most helpful? No one wants to be in an environment where they feel their voice is not being heard. And when, before, when I mentioned personal control, I've often said 
that kids will be more resilient and have more of a sense of ownership in school when they feel there are at least some decisions or choices that they are making about their own learning. Here also, just to think about that, for a parent, at home, if I were to interview your children and to say, what choices do you have at home during this very difficult time? Could they tell me one or two? What decisions are you making? The same in terms of school. Try to build it, try to build it in. Part of what's happened with the pandemic is that there are fewer choices, but I still think we can find one or two in which we help kids to feel, okay, I have some input during this difficult time. It will develop their own sense of personal control. And I raise this question, and this is a question I've been raising in all my webinars now. How can we respond to this need for self-determination in a time of remote learning? The third need is the need to feel competent. And any of you who know my work know, have heard me you talk about islands of competence. Almost 40 years ago now, it's hard for me to believe, I said one of our main things we should look at is each child's strengths or islands of competence. People said, how did you arrive at that image? I said, one day I came home and I had one of these days, I'm sure most of us have had it, as a therapist where I felt both my child and adult patients, I saw that they were not feeling very good. And I said, I had this image, they seem to be drowning in an ocean of inadequacy. And I said, if there are oceans of inadequacy, there must be islands of competence. And it was at that moment, almost 40 years ago, I said, you know, when parents come in to see me, I spend so much time about what's wrong with your child that I decided after just 10, 15 minutes of hearing about their kids' problems, I would say, now that I've heard about some of your child's problems, can you tell me what you see as your child's strengths, their beauty, their islands of competence? For when I go into schools about a kid, I will ask, now that I've heard about some of the problems after I've heard about a few, what do you see as your son or daughter's strengths, their beauty, their islands of competence? There was one boy I saw, one of the first kids I used this with, who had difficulty reading and paying attention in school. He was so desperate that he would get into fights that he later on, when he got to trust me in therapy, said, I'd rather get into a fight and be sent to the principal's office and have to be in a classroom where I felt like a dummy. So I started more and more saying, yet we cannot deny problems that a child is having, but if we don't see their beauty or strengths and how we can use these beauty and strengths with that boy who I just mentioned, we're gonna really lose them. That boy told me one of his islands of competence was that he loved to take care of his pet dog. To make a long story short, the principal appointed him pet monitor of the school. His teacher, and by the way, what that meant is he checked on the pets in the school. His teacher, this wonderful charismatic teacher said, I've checked every book in the school library. There's not one good book on taking care of pets. I think you should write a little book. He said, I have trouble writing. The teacher said, why do you think I became a teacher? And with, her help, he wrote a little book, How to Take Care of Pets. That book was bound and put in the school library. And by the end of the year, he lectured in every classroom in that building and how to take care of pets. And he no longer hit other kids because he felt much more competent. That teacher and school principal re really changed the tra tra trajectory of that child's life. And I just wanna show you one school for kids with learning problems. I spoke there and two years later I came back and I didn't know they did this. They were so taken by the notion of islands of competence that they had every child draw his or her strength and it was put up in the lobby. And in the lobby, when you walked in, here are all the kids' strengths and they actually had this islands of competence. And it has a quote from my book. You know what it feels like to go into school? And I realize a lot of kids are not going into school this year, but think about how we can create this. Islands of competence and you see kids' strengths. And the teachers also, I'm gonna go through this quickly. They, they used it to teach kids about strengths, about your dreams, about your difficulties. Some of the kids thought I was invited back a second time because I had not done a very good job the first time. So the teachers went along with it. 
and said, write Dr. Brooks notes of encouragement. This was wonderful. I put some together. I hope you ace it this time. Good luck. Don't worry if you have trouble. Real encouragement. And this person wrote, hope you do good. Love, Hiliani. And just very quickly, before I get to the fourth point, uh, there are several other examples. I have. One principal was so taken by this, and we could do this even remotely, that he, what he did was with his staff, he developed a very simple form. It's difficult to read. What are the student's islands of competence? So you list those. And what do you, how do you use these islands to help the students learn and feel digni more dignified? What well, wonderful shifts the way you see kids. And I'm going to pass the, and then the very last point, I hope you hear this, all of a sudden I got this note, internet insecure. I don't know if that's a psychological term. The very last need, so we have the need to belong, the need for self-determination, the, the need for competence. Actually, this is a part of competence. And then there's one more, I added this. We were must recognize a sense of competence associated with not being afraid to make mistakes. Like that boy who was, would rather get into a fight and be sent to the principal's office, he was terrified of making mistakes. So I'll mention this, and I had added this because I think it's so important, especially when we work with kids who struggle in school. There's a psychologist, Gabrielle Utengen, in her book, Rethinking Positive Thinking, who advises the following. When in anything, this is for adults as well, when we're looking at goals or strategies, it can be very helpful, and I'll stick with kids right now, to look at the goal and then say to them, let's look at what some of the obstacles may be to reaching this goal, but you don't leave it there, else you have a self-fulfilling prophecy for failure. What you also say is, if this obstacle comes up, how can we deal with it? How do we cope with it? What she found is, if you can go over what goals are, if you can anticipate what obstacles are, but then if you also can help kids think about how will we handle it if the obstacles come up, that is the best way to learn. If all you talk about are goals and don't prepare kids for setbacks, you're going to have a problem. If all you think about is setbacks, you're going to have a self-fulfilling prophecy for failure. So I always say to teachers, and some teachers I'm working with from last year, before the pandemic, Prepare, when you prepare lessons, have kids think about what are some of the obstacles? How do we cope with these obstacles? And the very last need, oh, I have that same thing again. The very last need is the need to feel a sense of purpose. And I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on this. When I was writing that book where my patient Rob's photos were in, uh, in there, I, I had asked uh, really 1,500 adults, many in the fields of mental health and, uh, and education, to think about the following. I said, I'm writing a book on school climate. What do people really remember about school? So the first question in this anonymously filled out questionnaire, of all the memories you have of school, what is one of your favorite memories? Something an adult said at the school that boosted your self-esteem, your motivation, your dignity as that principal had. And I wasn't sure what I was gonna get. Do you know what one of the most common responses was what helped you to feel a sense of dignity and motivation was when you were asked to help out. I got things like, I remember when a teacher asked me to pass out the milk and straws. I remember when a teacher asked me to tutor a younger child. And I remember saying, that's the number one positive memory of school. Little did I know now in all my books that we now know, not just in kids, but through our senior years, one of the most important things in being resilient is when you feel you make a difference in the life of someone else. So one of the things I've been saying so much, especially maybe even more so during the pandemic, and one of the things I'm also so heartened to see, we have to help people to feel they make a difference. Why? Well, what I've said I've been heartened to see is I've been so impressed almost every night on the news about kids volunteering to help others who are more in need, kids writing notes to first responders, kids running charity drives to raise money for those who are less fortunate. 
And one of the things I'd like us to think about, one for the parents, what are some of the charitable activities? See, what I call them are charitable or contributory activities you can engage in with your kids. What is maybe a school project in some way earning money or doing something or sending notes of gratitude? But this helps kids to feel, because I'm on this earth, maybe things are a little better, not in a narcissistic way. So here too, I raise this question. How can we respond to this need to feel a sense of purpose in a time of remote learning? So the guiding principles for me are personal control as charismatic adults to realize we have a lifelong impact on our children. And then as one model, just one, the need to belong, the need for self-determination, to feel you have a voice in things, the need to feel competent, and the need to feel a sense of purpose. So I am now going to uh, leave this, stop sharing, and hopefully we have about 10, 12 minutes for questions. Now. That was amazing, Dr. Brooks. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you right. very well. I did get a little nervous when all of a sudden across at my screen, Karen, it said, your internet is not stable. I said, oh my God, D did anything go wrong at all? There were a couple of little slow spots. Uh, oh, okay. Kind of hesitated the, the internet hesitated not you uh, but we've only got a few minutes so I want to try to ask you a few questions I'm so sure. I'm so interested in everything you've talked about so well, I'm not going to have enough time to ask you all the questions but I guess um, one thing that comes to mind is especially with this idea of islands of competence when you have a dyslexic child and, and let's say let's just for them for this moment talk about maybe students who have made it all the way into high school, sometimes they're not diagnosed mm -hmm. as early as they could be, right? right? And so they often have such self-esteem problems um, and they that can turn into uh, behavioral issues, things like that. Not always, but you know, oftentimes it does. Well, like that boy who was sitting other kids, you know, right. avoid the classroom, yeah. Right, so I would assume that helping that child find what they're good at, what they, you know, but it is, are there any specific things a parent or a teacher should do? Yeah, well, first of all, sometimes I love to ask kids, not that necessarily a parent's gonna sit down and say, so what are you good at? Because <laughs> that would seem foolish. Right. I just wanna mention this here, what your question triggered. There are a number of kids, I thought they'd be so eager to tell me, like that boy who told me he loved to take care of his dog. So right away, he became a pet monitor to the school. There are a number of kids who feel so defeated, Karen, that some will say, I don't know, or I'm not good at anything. Right. And the way I respond is, you know, a lot of kids feel that way at times, but we're going to try to figure that out. And I, I feel if I say it that way, we start figuring it out. So one of the things I, I, I say to parents and uh, teachers, sometimes, you know, I have a number of cases, I don't have time to go into it, where teachers and parents could tell me what kids are, are good at. Sometimes we do not, we may not know. One of the places I start then is, uh, is how can, in any school program, I, I have a school meeting I go to, I often will say, what is one thing, it gets to the last point, what is one thing that this child does at school that helps him or her to feel they're helping others. And quite often we, you know, they may not be. So one of the ways of showing an island of competence is, and this is one of my favorite techniques, I've had older kids who have struggled go down and read to first graders. There's wonderful research I have that shows kids are less likely who have struggled with learning to drop out of school, to drop out of school. if in that program, an hour, two hours a week, they go down to read to younger kids. They help us. I once worked with a kid who was very disorganized. You know what we built into his program? He went down to first graders and helped them at the end of a school day. He, he was a fifth grader. He was that much older. At the end of the school day, he helped them to put a, things in their backpack because oh, okay. his was always so disorganized. But they looked up to him like he was the expert. Well, he had to become more of the expert as with his own uh, bag there. And so I think there are things we have to find. But one of my favorite is if we're not sure what a kid's islands of competence are, if there is a basic need in all of us to feel we make a difference, that is often a starting point. Sometimes though there are, one pair, set of parents said, my daughter's like the Pied Piper of the neighborhood. Kids love her. 
And she would read, she was, you know, she was only like fifth, sixth grade or stuff, but she would read young kids. We built that into her school program. Kids who love artwork. Like that's why I love going to that school right. where I show those photos. Kids artwork was displayed. And sometimes it takes a little time, but it's very important to do. Well, so I'm curious if, cause I know there are teachers and parents probably watching this. Right. So let's say if you are a teacher and you feel like you're in a situation where you have, you have a parent who is not su being supportive to this child's um, empathy and, and self-reliance, uh, resilience at home. What can that teacher do? That question, Karen, there's a whole workshop I give on that. When one, I'm, sometimes when I'm upset with the teacher or parent because they're not following through, it gets back to empathy. You know, I start with the assumption we're all very well-meaning. You know, and sometimes just like with my son, you know, Rich, who's doing very well. I think he's writing a book called Daddy Dearest, but he, he's doing very well today. <laughs> oh, my children uh, might do that. I wasn't very, you know, empathic. So one of the things, if it's a teacher and a parent is not being as empathic, and God, I could spend hours on this. There's something I talk a lot about, joining techniques. Find something you agree with. So let's say the parent, the teacher, and it could be either way, either direction. They both agree that they want the child to be more motivated and to, to learn whatever it is. And even if their approaches are different, my style is, because I've had teachers actually tell me that if you give kids, you know, have them tutor younger kids, if you're reinforcing negative behavior. The kids who aren't doing their own work, you have them do this. I hear this all the time. So what I... Oh, we've got that glitch again in your internet. I think, Dr. Brooks, you kind of frozen on the screen. But unfortunately, did I freeze on the screen? Yeah, well, I hear you now, but you're still frozen on the screen. And you're frozen on your. Oh, okay. There we go. Now, now we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, joining techniques. I'll quickly say this. Uh, although this time I didn't get your internet is insecure, so I don't know what went on. But one of the things is. A joining technique, find five, just 5% 5 you agree with and then say, how do we reach this? So I'll say to teachers, I see we have the same goal of wanting this child to be motivated and responsible. Where I see we may differ is the best way to reach that goal. See, if you could join around a common goal and say it's the strategies we're using that may differ, then people don't get as defensive. If you say, you know, your approach is all wrong, just like that. People You're are sort of giving the self-determination. Yes, exactly. So you want to hear their viewpoint, but you're finding what you agree with. That's what, the power of what I call joining techniques. Right. You're right. trying to find what you agree with at these times. And then your approach may differ. But if you can find a common goal for a kid, like some teachers may say to me, I want my kid to do more, the kid to do more homework. The parent may say the same thing. I'll say, yeah, me too. But since they're not doing it, we got to figure out what's the best approach. So you're agreeing with the goal. Hopefully, I mean, the goals are the ones we can all agree with, Where, but you want to get into a discussion so everyone contributes to that discussion. And I just gave a whole philosophy in like two minutes that I could spend hours. I know, we're going to have to do a part three, I think. <laughs> um, I am, unfortunately, we are out of time and I'm oh. so disappointed because I, I could talk to you all afternoon. Um, but I do want to thank you very, very much for doing this for us. And I know that those watching will have other questions. Maybe they can um, shoot those to you through your website or they can, um, you know, log on and, and comment on our Facebook page and we'll, we'll get answers for them. But I really appreciate everything you've done today. And I want to thank everyone who's been listening. I want to remind you again about our IDA conference in, the, in November. It really is premier conference in the industry and you will learn a great deal if you attend. And uh, just because it's virtual, it won't be any less amazing. And I also wanna remind you also about the COVID fund. If you can even give a dollar, um, that will help us help students who need it the most right now. And for that, I guess that's it for us today. Thanks again. And it was a pleasure to meet you, Karen. And work Thank with you. you. You too.